The scripture reading this morning is Genesis 22. Please stand for the reading of God's word out of reverence for the Lord and his word. Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now, after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jitlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, bore Teba, Gehem, Tehash, and Meacah. This is God's word. It is true, and it is given out of his love. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. Well, I also want to be thankful to the choir for leading us in worship. It's always an encouragement to have them up here. And uh, it's just great to see the diversity of ages in choirs. It is usually not that way. That's all I'm going to say. But good to see some young people in the choir. All right. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us, we're a Bible teaching church, and we tend to walk through entire books of the Bible. So we're going through Genesis, which sets up the whole story. And sometimes there are mountaintops in the storyline, and this morning we are going to talk about a physical mountaintop, but it's also a spiritual and theological mountaintop. And if you're not a Christian, this story from thousands of years ago has everything to do with what this room is doing right now. And I invite you to join us as we live out this story. 
So, Father, I pray for help this morning that I would let this text preach itself and I would get out of its way. I am certainly a conduit, but only a conduit, and my failings are many. So I pray that I would allow Jesus to shine forth from this story of a mountain and a father and a son, a knife and a ram. May people who are traveling their mountain this morning be reminded that there is a great purpose and you are a good God. And they would leave this room utterly transformed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Does it ever seem like God is in the business of calling us to do things that make no sense? Sometimes God is just plain foolish. Let me say that again in case you thought you misheard me. Sometimes God is just plain foolish. There, I said it because some of you are struggling with that but have not been able to articulate that and be honest with the Lord. Before us sometimes is a call that seems to be from God's hand, but it is out of step with God's word. You ever been there? It's from his hands, but man, this this seems to go against his word. Maybe he has led you to a place of blessing just to withdraw it. Why did we even go down this road, Lord? Why did we even have to start this journey? How are you being kind to me right now? How is this wise? I really believe that God is sovereign, but is he always good? To those of you wondering whether God is sane, this just might be a word for you. Now, before we dive in, we need to ask a question because there are two ways you can go with this passage, and you will find that a preacher goes one of these two ways. Number one, this is a story about radical faith that we should emulate. Or number two, this is a story about a radical provision of God on our behalf. So, my friends, is this a story of radical faith or radical provision? The answer is, yeah, okay, thank you. You're with me this morning. And it's both because the New Testament recognizes as, as it as both. So we're going to journey down both rails this morning. So the movement before us is verses 1 through 8, to the mountain, then 9 through 14, on the mountain, and then 15 through 24, from the mountain. Pretty easy. Ready? Up to the mountain. Verse 1, after these things, and after means several years, God tested Abraham. We need to understand what a test is, otherwise the whole story falls apart. What does that mean? Well, I believe that God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is not wondering what Abraham is going to do in terms of the facts of the matter. God also doesn't tempt us. God is not sin, cannot sin, and the Bible says never leads us or tempts us into sin. But my friends, sometimes God draws strange lines. Sometimes we go on a Proverbs journey, but other times we go through a Job or Ecclesiastes journey. This is one of those Job journeys. What is a test from God? Number one, and it's an opportunity to reveal the glory of trust in God when everything seems opposed to it. When you have a choice that seems foolish, when you are trying to follow the Lord, and when it is so easy to trust in other things, a test is God asking you to put something so very valuable on the altar, like your ambition, like your safety, like your control, like your identity, like your sense of justice. And maybe... This morning, there are some parents out there that are being asked to put their child on an altar, in a sense. A test from God in the Bible is a critical threshold in the storyline. You will find these tests appear that the character obeys the Lord, and then there's a massive breakthrough. And then finally, a test is a dramatic portrayal of the gospel. It reveals the piece of architecture on the wall behind me. But a test though understandable, is still emotionally devastating. There are dads in this room. I see you, and many of you have sons. Do you feel this moment? 
I have three. I cannot imagine. If you do not feel this story, you have not understood this story. So we have God's foolish command. Verse 2. He says, Abraham, which means father of many nations. You, you need to feel the irony here. And Abraham says, here I am. And I suspect Abraham kind of knows something hard is about to come. But he nonetheless, he says, I'm over here and I'm available. He, he said, God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And for those of you not aware of the story, God has made a promise. This promise is decades old. He made a promise to an old couple way past childbearing age that they were going to have a child and that all of the future of Abraham and his family and his people and a land and a global reality rests on that one child. And he says, I want you to take that child and I want you to go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you, your son your only son, repeated two more times, verse 12 and 16. God is not dampening this moment. He is driving right into the heart of the matter. At this moment, God says, I want you to go. And when's the last big moment in Abraham's life when God said go? Do you remember? All the way back to chapter 12, where God says, I want you to go, I want you to leave everything you're familiar with, and I want you to follow me into this crazy story. Back in chapter 12, Abraham was asked to offer up his past. Now in chapter 22, Abraham has to offer up his future. And my friends, that is so much of a test for you and me. God is asking you to offer up anything that gets in the way or can be confused with God himself right now, right here. That's what's happening. So Abraham obeys. Abraham obeys. Three through eight, I, I want you to feel the drama of each of these steps that Abraham has to take. Think about it. He has to pack his stuff. He has to get the wood. He cuts the wood. He gathers his servants, each step closer to the mountain top. And it's a three-day journey, three days of testing in the wilderness, three days of being trapped in something like the belly of a fish, three days being entombed in this suffering. But he goes, he obeys to Moriah. We learn later in the Old Testament that that is what is current Jerusalem. And many argue that the place was on or near the Temple Mount, very near a mountain that would one day be called Calvary. And Abraham looks up to the top of Calvary. And it says, verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship. Because that's what you do at Calvary. That's what you do on the mountaintop. You worship. And get this, you've got to notice the little details of the story. We will worship and come again to you. We will come back down this mountain after we have worshipped the Lord. And he says, the text says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Okay, here again, details, details. That's a bundle of about 50 pounds, meaning Isaac is not an eight-year-old boy. Isaac is a young man. Some of the rabbis argued he was in his 30s. But let's just assume he was at least 18 years old, meaning he is aware of what is going on and he is strong enough to resist his dad. Meaning Isaac is walking by faith. This is a story of two men and their trust in God when everything seems to go against it. And it says that Abraham is holding the fire and the knife holding the implements of death. So you've got a father holding the implements of death. You've got the son carrying the wood that would burn him soon. And they're on a journey to the mountaintop. And at one point, verse 7, Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And I promise you, Isaac is not just figuring this out now. 
But it is not unlike a moment when a son, knowing what was about to happen, stopped in a garden and he knelt down and he prayed to his father and he said, Father, if it is your will, can you make this cup pass for me? And they keep going. There will be no lamb, but there will be a faithful God. He said, in verse 8, God will provide Elohim, will Jireh provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Right now, the Lord wants you to know his word is true. If the word has said it, it will come to pass. God is going to provide. How? I don't know and neither do you. But if you will follow all the word, you can trust God to keep all the word. I tend to be selective. There are parts of the Bible that seem easier to follow, that have evident fruit, and keep my future secure. And by secure, I mean how I would have it. But I am learning that that is not real faith, that I need to trust all the word, even when I don't understand it, even when it makes no sense, because I can trust God to keep all his word. Tony Evans, Pastor Tony Evans down in Dallas put it this way, when the final exam comes, don't forget what God taught you in the quizzes. Man, that's an important lesson. When the final exam comes, don't forget what God has taught you in the quizzes. I promise you, he is the same God. He is the same God. All right, that is to the mountain. And they keep going, and they get on the mountain, 9 through 14. And when they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Think about this. He's large rocks and pieces of earth. He's building this mound, and then he creates a pyre of wood, one piece after the other piece. He continues to do it, and then it gets more intense. He takes this son, remember, who is old enough to resist him, and the son willingly gives himself over to be bound. That means there is no way out And it comes to the point where Abraham takes the knife. This is one of the most dramatic scenes in the Old Testament. He's taking the knife. And I just picture maybe his lips are moving and he's saying it in his heart. The Lord provides, Elohim provides, Elohim provides, Elohim provides. And then his muscles tense up and he's ready to go. And you're like, ah! And then suddenly, God stays his hands, calling him twice. Abraham, Abraham, father of many nations, father of many nations. And Abraham says, here I am again. I'm available, Lord. Please tell me what the next step is. In verse 12, this beautiful verse, but one that makes you want to scratch your head. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to to him for now i know that you fear god seeing that you have not withheld your son your only son from me i thought you said god is omniscient i did did you mean it yes i still think it's true god knows all potentialities and actualities but not every experience in terms of intimate acquaintance let me ask you this does god know what it's like to sin does god know what it's like to be insecure And there are some things that have to happen in space and time. And then God knows it by intimate acquaintance. And one thing was Abraham's faith. But here's the thing. A God's now I know moment is also now you will know me moment. A test is so much about what happens in the tested person and through the tested person. And not just what it's saying to God. And the writer of Hebrews captures it this way in Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, meaning the knife was drawn, of whom it was said through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. Okay, so here's the situation. And some of you are in it now. You have the clear promise of God. And you have the clear call of God. And what do you do when they're in a collision course? 
you believe in a miracle. You believe in a miracle, which is the storyline of the Bible. I don't know how these two things are going to be uh, reconciled, but I believe God is going to do something that keeps his promise, and this obedience is going to turn out for a glory. And so the writer of Hebrews says this is what Abraham believed. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. However, this is not an Isaac resurrection story, is it? It is a ram substitution story. So we get to the ram. And this was the world's quietest ram, evidently. Uh, You know, like... (laughs) He opens his eyes, and there it is, caught in a thicket. This would have made some noise. So I was wondering, I mean, maybe, poof, it just miraculously appeared. You know, like chapter 21, we saw the parallels last week. Hagar opens her eyes, and there's a well there, so maybe it's a miraculous thing. But I have a suspicion that it was there, and the Lord veiled Abraham's eyes and Isaac's eyes, and then suddenly opened them. Which then means, while Abraham and Isaac were walking up one side of the mountain, there was a ram prancing up on the other side of the mountain. And every step they took toward the top, that ram proceeded a step. And they didn't know it, but it was going to be there exactly when, exactly where they needed the provision. And I believe that is true for you, brother or sister. Maybe you are climbing that mountain, and there's a ram coming up the other side. Where? Don't worry. When? Right on time. You can't see it, not yet. I think God doesn't want you to see it. This is the whole issue of living by faith and not by sight. If you could hear the ram, that wouldn't be faith. But you're trusting God's promise. He's going to provide. As, that, as you climb, the ram is climbing. And you will meet it. And how do I know this, by the way? Jay, why are you so sure about my ram? Because your little but important ram is anchored in to the ram of rams that has already been given for you and has taken your place. And that ram is actually a lamb who takes away the sins of the world. His name is Jesus. And this is a gospel drama. Again, if you're not a Christian, you're not familiar with the story. So many of these stories are historical, but they're also sermons preaching about what would happen in the future. And this is one of the most beautiful and dramatic foreshadowings of the work of a father who willingly gave up his son named Jesus, who willingly gave himself who carried the very wood that he would be crucified on to the mountaintop of Calvary, who was bound and he was offered up, but there was no ram for Jesus, was there? Jesus went all the way. Jesus went all the way. He was the one who would die in our place. John three sixteen. Can we say this together? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I hope that has even deeper meaning for you, his son, his only son. And then Romans 8.31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, his only son, but gave him up for all, us all, how will he not also with him give us all things The Lord provides. And in verse 8, it's Elohim provides. And in verse 14, it switches to Yahweh, Jehovah, Jireh. And I think that's important because, yes, God is sovereign and all-powerful. He's the creator, but he is also the redeemer and the lover of our souls. That God, that one God, with all of those characteristics, loves us so. And so he took our place. And I want you to know that this morning. So maybe that 
God is working on your heart right now. You've come into this room, maybe at the end of your rope, maybe at the mountaintop, and God has had a plan to meet you there. So I invite you. What do I do? You trust. What does that mean? You give as much of yourself as you know how to give to as much of him as you understand right now. Take him by faith. Trust that he is the ultimate lamb that takes away the sin of the world, meaning he has taken away your sin and trust him and trust him. And I promise he will take you the rest of the way. And so we have this faith-filled journey to the mountain and then on the mountain. And now there are echoes from the mountain. There's implications. This is an epicenter that will change the universe. So verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn first time in the Bible, God swears by his own character. Now that will happen repeatedly, but this is the first time, meaning this is a serious moment, declares the Lord, because you have done this And if not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So it's like God saying, see, brings out the contract. I told you, I signed my name to it. I told you I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. I will always do it. I'm good to my promises. God is basically quoting himself from Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. And it's all culminating in this chapter like a bookend starting in chapter 12 to show the necessity and glory of faith as the pathway to promise. How do I keep going down this road? How do I deal with this Mount Moriah journey I'm on right now? By faith. By faith. And that means not by works. Not by works. In this radical obedience, please understand, this is not a story of Abraham had such bravery and he was so courageous. No, this is a man who did not believe in his own power. All he had was the promises of God, so he obeyed. I promise you, if this is about human strength and self-sufficiency, and it was about Abraham and his control, and God shows up and God was like, okay, that son that you waited 24 years for, I want you to take him up to this mountaintop and I, I want you to take his life. And, and Abraham was like, oh, okay, I don't know what you've been sipping on, Lord, but let's sleep on this. We'll all feel better in the morning. Like you were the one that said, well, I would have this child and all of our future is dependent on this child. Abraham was not going to say yes if this was about his self-sufficiency. No, this is about the story of grace. This is about a man that had no grip on his life anymore. He had made some real stupid decisions, we remember, in this journey. And now he had learned himself out of that. And he was ready to say, I give up, Lord. I'm going to trust you. And even when this journey seems like it's the silliest thing, the craziest thing, the most foolish thing in the world, I am going to follow you. And then we have these final four verses. It's a quick epilogue. The nation begins. These children are being born to the house And there's this little uh, girl born in verse 23. Her name is Rebecca. And she's going to show up in the next chapter. So now we take this truth. And God wants us to abide by it. And I talked about those two rails of the radical faith and the radical provision. And so how do we apply that then to our life this week? Well, There's a doctrine I want you to accept, and it's a really, really important doctrine, and you may have not heard of it, at least put this way. It's called the doctrine of God's foolishness. The doctrine of God's foolishness. The foolish wisdom of God is in the gospel. And I got weird looks in the first service. They were a little more tired than you are. You got two extra hours of sleep, evidently, last night. But I promise you I'm not being blasphemous. In fact, this is what the Bible teaches. God is foolish in the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 4, in case you just want to check on it, that Christ crucified is foolishness to the world. But it is the wisdom and the power of God. And you need to accept that. If God calls you to do something that will be a drama of his heavenly foolishness, then bask in it. Don't push it away. 
Because you are part of a story of glory. And you get to be a part of it. Has God broken your heart recently? He did it because he saw that it was not in fact mended. You were trying to mend it on your own fleshly ways. So he has broken it so he can now fully mend it, fully heal it. Has God taken something precious from you? Inasmuch as anything as an instrument to further God's purposes, that thing was never yours to begin with. And from chapter 21 and 22, remember that God takes and we give in order to receive even more. I promise you that pattern is true. Whatever he has taken, he will give back in greater and more pure measure. And it will be focused on him. It will cause you to focus on him. And young people in this room, please, this is a critical moment. Some of you have not had a journey to Moriah yet. And it is in these moments where you need to have a Moriah theology that you will keep with you, close with you for the rest of your days. One of the things that pastors don't really know what to do with is a middle-aged person that has never developed a Moriah theology and suddenly they hit catastrophe and they don't know what to do with God. And they actually think that God is foolish to the heavens and they bail. I want you to know that God seems foolish to the wisdom of this world, but I want you to know that his foolishness is a wisdom of glory and of heaven and of eternity. And you need to have this theology now. And God is going to give you some precious things. And the more actually precious it is, the more it will be tested. And if you look at all the saints of the scriptures and all of the saints throughout church history, there is not a mature godly man or woman that hasn't been greatly tested with the most important things that God has given them, like a spouse, like a child, like a calling. If God gives you those precious things and they are precious, God knows they're precious. He knows that you will love those things. And in fact, God loves those things. He will test those things. And you need to have a theology of the cross in that moment. And so I'm begging you, young people, You may not have had to go through this journey yet, but you've got to have a theology that makes sense of this journey that will draw you closer to the Lord rather than farther away. How do we do that? Here's the next and final thing. You consider Christ. You consider Christ. The writer of Hebrews, I think, has Genesis 22 in his mind at several points, but this is the way he puts it in chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Consider Christ crucified. Consider the logic of all of that. He says it again in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses like Abraham and Isaac, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All right, stop there for a second. I'll probably never run a full marathon. I think that day has flown by, okay? But I am told by you marathoners that there is a moment around mile 20 called the wall where you just, your body's like, see you later. Tunnel vision. And you have to make a decision. You older saints... You have, you have been there in your walk with the Lord. So what gets you to keep going so that you breast the tape? You've got to look to Jesus. You've got to look to Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And this isn't just cognitive. I actually think that when you look to Jesus, the Holy Spirit does a work. If he is seated at the right hand of the Father, then he is working. He's working for you. Jesus' session isn't his passivity. It is his activity. He is praying for you. 
Right now, believer, he is praying for you. He is giving you grace right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is pouring his grace out to you. And this whole reflection on Christ crucified is his gift to you as the theologic of life. That through suffering comes glory. That through suffering comes glory. And so are you in in an excruciating journey? Look to Christ. Has the Lord called you to something you cannot bear? Look to Christ. Has God taken something he gave you in the first place? Look to Christ. Is there a deep and good longing in your heart? God is not satisfied yet. Look to Christ. Is God calling you to a journey where you will be called to die to all comforts and assurances and things that fund you? Then look to Christ. And I wonder if if there's anybody in this room right now that are like, Jay, that just seems like preachy, sloganeering. You don't know what's been happening to me or has happened to me or the horrible things happening in the world right now. Really? Just look to Christ. Okay, my friend, and I say this because I love you. Not because I'm trying to correct you. I love you. If looking to Christ seems like sloganeering, and oversimplification, you do not understand the cross. And I'm going to plead with you to put those other things that are really bad and are really hurtful to the side and deal with the absolute infinitude of the cross of Christ. Because that's all I got. Because that's what the scripture has got. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. When you wake up tomorrow morning, look to Christ. When you go to bed tonight, look to Christ. Look to Christ. And I wonder if Jesus is the glory of the universe and God wants us to be profoundly satisfied and joyful and beholding that glory is what we're designed for. I wonder if his journey for you right now to Moriah is just to get your attention back on Jesus. Look to Christ. Behold Christ. So, Father, as we go to the table and we dine upon the gospel, draw us to Jesus. Draw us to Jesus. Show us Christ. Amen.